Hello developers and architects and welcome to another video on building event driven applications. In this video today, you're going to learn all about request response communication. Now you might think you know request response communication pretty well already. You've got an API that makes a request or something handles that request and a response comes back to the caller. Simple, right? But what about request response in an asynchronous world? How does request response work when you're building event driven systems where you're prioritizing asynchronous communication using events instead of making these direct synchronous HTTP goals. And that is exactly what you're going to take away from this video, how you can build request response style communication between two specific services in a completely asynchronous event driven world. Let's get into it. And to start, let's actually set a little bit of context of exactly what you're going to work with today. Imagine you are building an application for a pizza restaurant. And when somebody submits the pizza order, you're really hungry and hopefully you're not watching this at lunchtime, the request comes into the order processing system. And that order processing system is actually what's going to process your order. Now, before the pizza can go off and be made, you want to make sure that that pizza has been paid for. So you've also got a payment service somewhere over here that's in charge of dealing with payment providers, taking payments, ensuring that you've paid for the pizza that you've ordered. And if you were building this in a typical synchronous way, the request would come into the order API, request over to the payment, and the payment service would take the payment and hopefully return a 200 response back to the call that the payment has been taken successfully. And this is absolutely fine. And in a lot of cases, you actually want this synchronous communication. You want to know immediately if a request was successful or not. How could you make this a little bit more asynchronous to remove that direct point of coupling? Let's look through this exact same workflow. Again, you've still got your order processing service over here, and you've still got the payment service over this side. But remember, we're building event-driven applications, and when it comes to doing this kind of communication with an event-driven system, there's two real primary ways of doing it, and that is orchestration versus choreography. And to understand the difference between the two, let's again look at this point of integration. If you are building with choreography, you're allowing your system to integrate in a choreographed way, all you're simply doing is reacting to events. When the order first gets submitted, your order processing service is going to publish an order submitted event onto some kind of message channel. And your payment service is interested in that order submitted event because it knows when an order gets submitted, it needs to go off and take the payment, work with the bank, take some money. Once the payment service has successfully taken the payment, it is also going to publish an event back onto the event bus. And hopefully that will be a payment successful event because that payment has been successful. Of course, the order processing service is then going to listen for that payment successful event. And now that you know the payment's been successful, the order processing service can go on and do some other work. And this is an example of choreography. You just have events flying around and systems are just reacting to events. So although this is kind of like request response, it isn't really. Because these two services aren't communicating directly, you don't have a requester and a responder, you simply just have a service producing events and another service reacting to events. Now, this is the primary method of communication you're going to see in an event-driven system. Systems are just reacting to events that other systems publish. But what about in this specific scenario where you have a more direct line of integration? You know that when an order comes into the order processing service, that you need to make sure that the payment has been taken before you go any further but you want to keep things more asynchronous. You want to remove them synchronous lines of communication. And this is where orchestration becomes quite helpful. So again, we reset. We've got our order processing service and we've got our payment service. And with orchestration, you have some kind of central orchestrator monitoring what is currently happening and what needs to happen next. That's typically some kind of workflow. So what might happen? is the request comes into the order processing service to submit the order, to create the order. And the order processing service may still produce an order submitted event onto some kind of message bus. And this might be a private event inside the boundary of the order processing domain. And if you're not familiar with the idea of public and private events, go and check out my last video. It'll be floating around above my head somewhere right now. So when that order submitted event hits the internal event bus, an actual workflow is going to kick off here inside the order processing domain. And this is an orchestrator. The orchestrator is going to be in charge of what needs to happen to get this order over the line. What other services do I need to communicate with? And of course, the orchestrator knows that the payment is the first thing that needs to happen. And there's a couple of things that could happen here. Of course, the orchestrator could go off and make that synchronous request 
to the payment service. The payment service will do its work, come back, 200 response, and the workflow continues. But remember, we want to keep things asynchronous. We want to remove them synchronous points of coupling. What the orchestrator can do is still publish some kind of event onto a public event bus. So remember, this is a public bus and this is a private bus inside the boundary of the order processing service. So the orchestrator may still publish an event onto this public event bus. But really importantly, the orchestrator is going to include a couple of extra pieces of information in that event that it publishes. The first thing it's going to include is a correlation ID, some kind of callback token. You'll learn why that's important in just a moment. The second thing the order processing orchestrator is going to include is some kind of response channel. And what the response channel tells the payment service is where exactly to send the response once it's finished doing its work. So if you follow this through now, the orchestrator is going to publish an event onto some kind of event bus. And in that event, it's going to include a correlation ID, let's say one, two, three, four, five and some kind of response channel, the address of this channel. That might be an SQSQ URL. It might be a Kafka topic. It might be a specific partition on a Kinesis stream, but it's going to include some kind of response channel. The payment service is going to take that event, go off and do some work. And after it's finished doing the work, it knows that there is a response channel to send a response to, and it's going to make a request back to that response channel. And importantly, when that response goes back to the response channel, that one, two, three, four, five correlation ID is going to be included. Now your orchestrator can pull the response channel. It can see that there's a new message on the response channel, see that that is for one, two, three, four, five, and the workflow can go on its merry way. And this is actually a really, really powerful pattern because the orchestrator here, point in which it publishes that initial event, it knows it is going to expect a response at some point. This is a request response style integration, remember? So you know in your workflow, you're expecting to see a response. What this also means though, is that you can start to handle failures. Let's imagine that you expect the payment service to take no more than 10 seconds to process the payment. If this workflow is waiting for longer than 10 seconds, you can go off and do something else. You might publish a second event. You might try again, you might retry. With a payment service, you probably don't want to be doing that. You don't want to risk the payment being taken multiple times. So you might root off and you might have a human in the loop. So your workflow then goes off to a human and says, hey, John, can you go and check the payment for this pizza order just to make sure that that's completed successfully? You can build in retries, you can build in error handling, and you've got this central orchestrator that contains all of the logic. What should happen if a payment comes back and it's failed? What should happen if a payment succeeds? How do we handle timeouts and things that are taking too long? You can build all that functionality into this central orchestrator. So what are the important points to take away there? The first is that it is entirely possible and perfectly valid to build these request response style integrations when you're building an event driven system. And of course, the options you have are to use orchestration or to use choreography. Now, typically choreography is a lot simpler to implement. You're just publishing events and services are consuming them events. And maybe at some point later, you as a producer expect a response event to come back. The order gets submitted. And then at some time later, the payment is successful. So this is great. It gives you less complexity. You've got less moving pieces. And like I said before, this is typically the default mode of operation when you're building an event driven system. You just have events flying around. But for these points in your system where you want to have a little bit more control, you want to really understand if something completed successfully or not. Or if you have this point of integration that is more direct, the only service that cares about the order submitted event is the payment service so that the payment can go off and actually take the payment. And we know that every time an order is submitted, it needs to be paid for before it goes any further. This, this can be a really good point to introduce an orchestrator and you can do that in a way that keeps it asynchronous. So your orchestrator is gonna publish an event and it might even send a command. It might not necessarily be an event. The order processing orchestrator might simply say, here, take this payment. And the payment service is going to do that work asynchronously. And it's going to send a response back to a response channel, including some kind of correlation ID or callback token, so that when the orchestrator picks that response back up, it knows exactly which order and which workflow that relates to. So that's how you can do asynchronous request response. Remember, publish messages onto a channel, 
include some kind of correlation ID, some kind of link and some kind of response channel for your consumer to send the response back to. That's all for this video. As always, if you've got any comments, I'd love to hear them below. Please like and please subscribe if you want to see more of this event-driven architecture content, and I will see you all in the very next video. Thank you for watching.